Hello friends, here's another quick look at some of the important information at CitizenCon 2021. In this video we'll be looking at Gen 12 and the Vulkan Renderer. One of the main ways Star Citizen performance will be improved. This talk is going to be a bit dry and won't have the best visuals, but it should be helpful in understanding how the game will be optimized. Thank you for coming to my tomato talk. Gen 12 itself is just the name for the game renderer, the system that passes the data into the game world. In this video we'll be walking through the current rendering process, looking at how Gen 12 will improve the process, talking about the Vulkan API and finishing with what comes next. First, let's look at the renderer itself. The renderer is currently used as a pipeline that passes the 3D engine instructions into a tangible image for players to see. Currently, this is done by grouping and deciphering all game meshes to display them correctly in the game, before then sending them to the screen. This pipeline currently acts as a bottleneck due to these processes needing to run each frame in the correct order in a complex manner. By replacing this outdated rendering model with a Gen 12 renderer, the developers aim to pair every object in the world with its corresponding render pass right at the initial startup time. This frees up all those complex tasks from being so interdependent, and allows for a smoother flow of data in this rendering pipeline. Now during the panel this got into a discussion of how Gen 12 will allow the team to take advantage of multi-threaded code. For this explanation they use the analogy of building a house due to its inclusion of tasks that depend on other tasks. This will be the same analogy but with prettier colors. Let's say you have a house to complete with three workers. These three workers represent our CPU cores on hand. The time they take is the time taken to pass to the GPU, and occupancy is the CPU utilization percentage that you would see on your task manager. You can see in this diagram that each red action is a point where one task is dependent on the other to continue. Each time we reach one of these red points, we need to jump to another CPU core to keep working on that next task. While this isn't inherently bad, it could be much better. Instead, you could move some of your processes around to open core positions to decrease time and increase utilization, completing more work in a shorter amount of time. The renderer can continuously collapse these processes into smaller chunks of time and make better utilization of the CPU and GPU that you might have installed. This will lower the critical metric in this rendering process, the frame time and should have an effect on load times and frame rates across the board. Now we'll talk about how these optimizations will be achieved. To be completely honest, this part was pretty difficult for me, but the current method of rendering seems to allow the main CPU thread to work on the data included in the next frame of your game, while the render thread is working on the previous frame. The problem with this is that it does not scale to take advantage of multiple cores resulting in that bottleneck in the rendering pipeline we talked about. Additionally, because the main thread and render thread both need to synchronize with vSync, bad load balancing occurs when one of the threads needs to be delayed in order to make time with the other. As you can see in this diagram, all of the draw calls that are taking place in order to render the game are occurring on the render thread. These are denoted by the blue and yellow stripes. Ideally, the renderer will use a parallelization system to execute the same code on different object instances across all CPU cores, reducing latency in the preparation to send it to the GPU. This is a multi-step process that the team is currently in the middle of. Phase 1 consists of moving their own rendering code out of the render thread like we saw earlier. That might mean more to you than it does to me, but it is most definitely a lot of work. This will actually allow for less code to already be running on the render thread, hopefully yielding some results for the developers in this first phase. After all of the render thread code has been moved to the multiple cores in parallel, the Vulkan API can begin to be utilized. This allows the possibility to create GPU calls on multiple threads, which is virtually impossible in Star Citizen right now. Once that is done, the render thread will be completely removed and a much larger amount of objects will be able to be rendered at a lower impact time to frames. Better utilization of CPU resources will also be a noticeable benefit. Now onto the Vulkan API. 
First, let's define an API. An API is a tool that is used for development that can interface between our graphics cards and the devs who are building the game. So obviously APIs are very important in making sure you get the best visual experience while playing. And this one specifically will be used to generate multiple threaded GPU callings after the complete removal of the render thread from the CPU, as we discussed earlier in this video. See, while the devs are going to be doing all of that work we talked about, the Vulkan API is still necessary to gain the most efficiency. But this isn't all the Vulkan API will do for the game. It will also allow Star Citizen to take advantage of variable rate shading, bindless resources, and GPU accelerated ray tracing. Another segment that sees a lot of benefits from Vulkan are shaders. For shader rendering, Vulkan will utilize the DirectX compiler to take the HLSL code that CIG developers write into Vulkan compatible Spear V code, which is where many new optimizations will be possible. This will then be transferred to readable shader microcode for your overworked GPU. Vulkan will also allow VRAM to be managed by the developers instead of the software drivers. This is good because the devs know what resources may be specifically needed and when much better than the computer might. The amount of allocation being done with this newer process allows for much more flexibility. As you can see on the right, the new process clearly looks much more complex and organized, so it must be better. <sighs> Sorry, that was, that was a joke. With this understanding of Vulkan, let's move on to the render graph. The render graph is a sequence of stages that allow the devs to determine points of synchronization during the rendering of a frame in the game. It also acts as a tool for the visualization of these stages and the resources being used. It was at this point that I started to have deja vu as the diagram of the render graph felt a lot like the renderer from earlier. The render graph, from what I gather, is going to be very useful in frame rendering optimization. Overall, this implementation of the Gen 12 renderer is focused on creating a more efficient system that can make use of newer, more flexible technologies in ways that I can only pretend to talk about with such confidence. But there's no time to rest. Let's look at where in this process of optimization we are in Q4 of 2021. The architecture discussed early in this video is actually all in place now. A hybrid rendering approach is currently being used, with post effects, fog, and lighting all running through Gen 12. Something we've been made aware of in the recent monthly reports. These first features will be in 3.15, and work is already well underway on transitioning all scene and geometry rendering as well, which will undoubtedly have a noticeable impact. Next on the agenda will be gas clouds, render to texture, and transparency applications at which point the conversion will be complete and we will start to see some milestones reached. The first of these milestones will be full usage of Gen 12 with continued support for DirectX 11 drivers of yore. After that will be the Vulkan API release, and finally, multi-threading performance will be optimized. No real dates or tangible timelines were given here, but we saw the conversion begin over the summer and will continue to watch very closely into next year. My guess is that these milestones will begin sometime next year and will continue into the following. Of course, long-term plans are always being considered as well for after these optimizations. This includes more GPU optimizing with technologies such as DLSS, async compute, and variable rate shading. But then will come some of the more exciting additions, such as mesh shaders, which will create procedural geometry for things like asteroids, and of course, ray tracing for global illumination and real-time reflections. This has been one heck of a dive into game optimization. I did not understand most of it and therefore could not give my best breakdown of the concepts, but I hope this video did help in some way. These optimizations are something you will hear players asking for every day. The game has never run very well, but these new possibilities being created could help quite a bit to improve the performance in-game for all players. The additions that follow sound like they could lift the game to another level graphically as well. While this was a very difficult panel to get through, trust me, I watched it several times and I'm starting to lose my mind a little bit, you may have heard in the video. The panel did do a lot to inform us of the optimization we were previously lacking a bit of detail on. I enjoyed the information, but feel it got a bit repetitive at points. 
I hope to hear more next year, and my thanks goes out to all involved. If you've enjoyed this review and would like to know more, please subscribe to the channel. And if you would like to support what I do, you can join my Patreon for as low as a dollar a month and get perks like early videos, monthly summaries, and more. I hope you learned something in this video, and I'll catch you in the next. Thanks to my top supporters, TK, Ken Garcia, Valiant15, The Alpaca, Holston Coop, The Huntress, Dasek, Guilty Conscious, Extreme Tuber 7, El Gordo, Jarzy, Niku, Jin, Bilal Eliasem, and Brian Peterson.